I'm Sally. I'd like to start by thanking Deb for involving me. I'm thrilled that there is a place today to have a quick look at the psychology of what's going on in NMOSD. But I didn't know what to call my presentation, so I gave Deb a call and we had a chat about, you know, for 20 minutes, what can I leave with you to take away and have a think about? Because I would love to have you all for eight hours, I'd lock the door, we'd go through everything, but she wouldn't let me. So I have 20 minutes. So I titled it, What Am I Meant to Do With This? Because I think that kind of summarises many aspects. What am I meant to do with this diagnosis? I've never heard of NMO. What the, is M -M NMO? Like, oh, I might have heard of MS, but what's NMO? What am I meant to do with these symptoms? What am I meant to do with the fact that it's largely invisible? What am I meant to do with the pain that is happening that nobody can see and then it goes? What am I meant to do with my eyesight problems in one eye and then I wake up and it's in the other eye? What am I meant to do with the very interesting way my neurologist wants to talk to me about this? What am I meant to do with the responses I get from the well-intentioned auntie that says, oh, I thought the medication was going to make you feel better. Or isn't the medication meant to fix it? Why aren't you working? You look fine. Etc. Etc. See how much I can talk just with the title slide? So I'll move on. I'm a health psychologist. I have a focus on working with people with MS. So it's not a focus on people with NMO, but I have worked with people with NMO as well. I wanted to start with a little bit of an idea of how I found my way to my thesis topic, my health psychology thesis topic. I have a background in science, I did a postgrad in psychology, and I decided I've always been interested in physical health and how it impacts on psychological health and vice versa. So we'll do a doctorate of health psychology. My parents said, seriously, maybe you could get a job. And I said, no, I'll just keep studying. But the university said to me, Sally, what are you going to look at with your research? And I didn't know, because I'm actually really good at procrastinating if I'm not that interested in my study topic. So I knew I had to be passionate in order to finish it. And then, I kid you not, I was diagnosed with MS at that point in time when the neurologist said, you've got MS, and I thought, what? Sorry, what? I then became that person that thought, I'm going to study something that I'm actually living. So my thesis looked at how people coped with the diagnosis of MS in the first 12 months following diagnosis. Basically, I was looking at how people tried to find a little bit of control when they're facing a diagnosis where there is no certainty at all for them in that first 12 months. So I just wanted to share that with you so that you know why I'm so interested in this topic of chronic neurological conditions and the very significant impact it has on everybody, particularly around uncertainty and control and how fantastic a day like this can be for your psychology and can leave you thinking, wow, there were some people in that room that were a little bit scary, but also why aren't I as good as that guy over there? Where am I headed? I like this because I think that it's a good thing that everybody can reflect on. A crisis event often explodes the illusions that anchor our lives. So you thought you knew who you were and then you were diagnosed with NMO and you thought, whoa, what's just happened to my sense of self? And who was I before? And who am I now? And how do I incorporate this label into my life? What am I meant to do with this? And I really would love to have you for many more hours than 20 minutes. But I thought the focus could be on, I think, what should you do with this diagnosis? I think you really need to be very strategic. And I think everybody in life should be strategic. If you have a chronic condition, it ups, ups the ante for you. I think you have to be strategic with your communication with others, whether that be your best friend, your partner, your parents, the random person in the shopping centre that wants to make a big deal about your disability sticker, the health professionals that you work with, everybody that you are going to be talking to about this strategy will work better than no strategy. I want you to be strategic around the way you speak to yourself about this, the way you frame your words, the semantics you use about who's in control, is it about you controlling the NMO? 
Is it about the NMO controlling you? Or should we actually be using words like, how am I best going to manage? How do I manage this? And decision making, strategy and decision making is always good. And I also thought today I could talk about being resilient. And that might make everybody think, oh yeah, okay, resilience, let's talk about resilience again. Because I think we do a lot of talking about resilience. It's really important for us to be resilient. It's important for our kids to be resilient. But it's very difficult for people to name what becoming more resilient looks like. How do you become more resilient? And I don't want you to leave today without actually having one or two things to go home and try so that you can increase your own resilience so that you just have a better time facing challenges in the future, whether it's NMO related or not. And res being resilient is about looking at your psychological resources and building on them. So the medical guys bring the colourful graphs. I have, I'm a psychologist. I have to show you a picture of Freud. <laughs> even if I'm not a big fan, but we all kind of know that photo. So Freud and his cronies used to say, let's look at psychopathology and let's see what's wrong with you and how can I fix you? Because I'm the psychologist, I'm gonna fix what's going on in that head. I'll diagnose you with one or more things and then I'll fix it. And that's just not what I'm about. Freud famously wrote a letter to, well, a few people, but to one person, and he said, well, as a psychologist, really what I aim to do is turn my patient's hysterical misery into mundane unhappiness. <laughs> it's not what I'm aspiring to do, okay? So that's not really what psychology is about today. Rather, I subscribe to a background of positive psychology, which is a terrible name because it makes people think of emoticons and looking on the bright side and that's not what I'm about. It's a strengths-based approach to psychology. It's saying, as a psychologist, I'm not gonna fix you. My work, I love my work, because I work with people who are not psychiatrically unwell. You know, those of you in the room, most of you, I'm sure there's probably one or two, no. We're all well, we're well people, we're struggling with a chronic condition. So who am I to tell you how to do things better, but why don't we have a look at how you're doing things really well already and where your strengths are? So now we have positive psychology, the focus is on human strengths as well to complement the traditional emphasis on healing the damage or getting things um, better. So Martin Seligman is kind of today's version of Freud, oh, that's probably not the right thing to say, but he's, he's a great guy, does a lot of research around the world in this area, and he says that as as well as looking at your strengths, a wonderful thing to do is to recognise that habits of thinking need not be forever. And he said one of the most significant findings in psychology in the last 20 years is that individuals can choose the way they think. Now this sounds ridiculously simple. Let me assure you it is terribly difficult to change the way you think. It's really very difficult. But it's possible and it's a fantastic aspect of psychology that you can reframe perspective and you can move forward thinking about things differently. So when we look at resilience and psychological resources, these positive psychologists are looking at areas like this. And this is where I like to work with my clients, looking at building one's ability to have great levels of resilience so that we can all face challenges. Looking at strengths, you can learn how to be optimistic, Practicing gratitude and kindness, you've probably heard about recently, and it's, it sounds ridiculous, but it really does work. Mindfulness is important. Who are you? Having a good look at where is your identity, particularly pre and post a diagnosis like this. Most people will say to me, I don't want to identify as my disease. I don't want to be that person. But we all know that that is now a part of your identity. So how are you going to reconcile that? Do you want to just go, la, 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 not happening, I'm refusing to talk about it? You certainly might not want to be the person that only talks about it at the family barbecue because nobody will want to sit next to you if this is the only thing you want to talk about. But there needs to be a balance because it is part of the identity now. So how do you figure that out? And we know that this idea of problem-focused coping rather than emotion-focused coping is a much better way to approach life generally, but particularly if you're somebody with a chronic illness. And goal setting is really important. 
So I just wanted to um, talk about an analogy that I talk about quite a bit, which is the CEO analogy. And I'm talking to everyone in the room now, not just the people with NMO, but everybody. Everybody that's here because I believe it's a good way to look at life strategically, whoever you are. I think that, you know, oh, now I sound a little bit American, a little bit life coach, and I don't mean to, but I think that everybody, when you're born, you have one job in life, and that's just to have the best life you can. That's your job. You only live once. That's it. And it doesn't matter how you view what the best life looks like. So we could have one person that says, if I accrue millions of dollars to pass on to my children, then I'm going to have the best life. Great, I don't care. Honestly, that's your thing. Somebody else might say, I want to travel to every country and live in different, fantastic different cultures, that's your thing, no problem. It's not for me to say what makes your life the best life, but it's for you to say that. And I think if your job is to live the best life you can possibly have, we can compare it to maybe the CEO of a company. You might be the CEO of the company, your company is your life, your job as the CEO is to have the best company you can, build the best life you can. Mostly the best CEOs of this world are objective, they're strategic, they take good advice, but they make wise decisions. Some of them are rich. <laughs> We're not going to talk about money. <laughs> if you are the CEO of your life and your company, I was saying this to somebody many years ago, actually, who had MS, and I was talking to her, talking through this analogy, and she said, Sally, that's all very good for the guy that's walking out on the street there. He doesn't have MS, so she had MS. He doesn't have MS, so he's the CEO of his company. He can do whatever he wants. He can make up any kind of objectives he wants to reach, and he can reach them because he doesn't have MS. And I thought, hmm, I still think that you can have a great life with MS, with NMO, but how are we going to shift this way of thinking that now it's all over? So I said, okay, in the CEO analogy, we have to position the NMO somewhere because it's not your boss. It doesn't rule you, but likewise, you can't fire it. We can't fire NMO because we don't have that cure yet, but it also doesn't rule your life. So where are we going to put it? So I think on a visual, you're the CEO, so you're up in the penthouse. I want you to put the NMO somewhere, maybe the fourth floor, maybe a corner office, connect it to Facebook, hope it wastes its life over there, <laughs> send in some donuts, some coffee, let it hang out. Now, I'm being quite flippant because I know that NMO can affect most waking moments. If it's stable, if it's stably presenting things to you, you might be able to just park it and continue on. It's important as a CEO to know what's going on in that office, to know what the NMO is doing. I'm not saying just shut it away, think it's, everything's fine and move on, but I'm saying let's position it somewhere where it's not above you, where it's being managed by you. The NMO is almost appointed to your company by the board of directors. You can't fire it. The board of directors is who? We don't know. We listen to these gentlemen, they try to tell us maybe why but we think it's probably a combination of genetics, environment, we're not sure, for whatever reason. Is it God? Is it genetics? It's all something together. We know we can't get rid of it. But that doesn't mean we can't manage it. The job of a CEO also takes um, the form of somebody that hires the top level executives. So in your company, which remember is your life, you're the CEO, who are you going to hire into these positions? And I think if you've got NMO in your life, you need to have, as a top-level executive, somebody that has a pretty good understanding of what's in your company, which is NMO. You need to find a neurologist who has some insight into this um, issue for you in your company, and that's not easy because the statistics we just heard about the prevalence of this disease means that there are not going to be that many neurologists who spend the time knowing this disease as these guys over here. But I know sometimes I have somebody that comes and sees me and they've been diagnosed with MS, and I say, oh, what's the name of your neurologist? And they give me a name I've never heard of. And I say, oh, I haven't heard of that MS neurologist. Oh, no, they're not um, an MS specialist. They're really important in stroke. Like, they go all around the world and they talk about stroke. And I think, oh, but you don't have a stroke. Why, why are you seeing them? I think it's important that if you're the CEO, I know it's difficult, but to find people that are in your company that have the expertise, Richard Branson, the CEO of Virgin, 
Virgin Everything, Atlantic, says quite openly, I am not the smartest guy, but I employ really smart people. And he, can you imagine the meeting that the marketing top exec would have with Richard Branson? So Richard, we've been spending 18 months on this amazing marketing strategy, this is how we think you should move forward. And you can picture Richard Branson going, hmm, nah, I don't really like it. And the marketing manager thinking, but I know a whole lot about this. And Richard Branson saying, well, I'm certainly, you would hope, treating his top level executives with a lot of respect which is what we should be doing with our neurologists. A lot of respect. They know what they're talking about. But we also need to be able to take their opinions on and think about it and discuss it with them. And that's why I've written behaviour in meetings and a good fit with the company. When you go and see your neurologist, picture yourself as a CEO and you're having a meeting with a top-level exec, I think it's a really good idea for you to have an agenda with you so that you don't go to the neurologist, have a lovely discussion about three things that maybe they are bringing up with you based on your recent scans or test results. And then you get back to the car and you think, oh, I forgot to ask them about the pain and what to do about the pain. So as the CEO, I would say to you, you have one meeting every few months, six months, 12 months with this top level exec. Why didn't you bring something written that you could have a chat to them about? It's important, of course, to hear from the neurologist and what they want to say to you, but it's also important that you don't forget the, do the dot points that you have. Consultants, somebody said to me the other day, oh, you're one of my top level executives. And I said, no, I'm not. You shouldn't have a psychologist that you have for, the, for your whole life. I'm a consultant. I'm not a top level executive. If you want to have, um, some advice and some strategic discussion about where to go in this life, come and see a psychologist for a few sessions. But you do not need to put me on staff. You probably don't need to put an OT on staff. You might not need to put a personal trainer, maybe, or a dietitian on staff, but maybe it would be great to have a few sessions with them to figure out where you can move forward from them. Because they've got expertise that you might not have. Have a chat to them and see what you can glean so you can move more forward strategically. And I've got a worksheet that you can take home if you like, which asks you to have a look at the departments in your company if you were this CEO. Where are the departments and are they all going well or do some of them need attention? So I'll give you a quick example. I have, um, let's say, oh well, a million departments. We all have a million departments, but I might have a health department and I might have a family department and an employment department, etc. In my health department, I might have an MS department and a non-MS department. MS department, am I on the medication that I think is right for me? Tick. Am I managing symptoms? Tick. Is everything going okay? Fine. Move on. What's the next department? Hmm. Now, I think I can, should say that I've moved on in this department, but a few years ago, I could very honestly say to you, I have this exercise department. And because I'm the CEO, I write all of the policy for all of my departments. And my exercise policy goes something like this. Sally should be exercising three times a week, maybe half an hour each session, a combination of strength-based training and maybe a little bit of aerobic exercise. If Sally is sick, she doesn't have to exercise. If, you know where this is going. If Sally is um, having a relapse of MS, she doesn't have to exercise. If she's on holiday, she's not exercising. Every other week of the year, Get out and exercise, that's your policy. Now as the CEO and as somebody that lives in Melbourne, we have fairly good access to education and knowing what's good in exercise. I don't have to consult a physiotherapist or a personal trainer to tell me that that's a wise, sound exercise policy. It's not going over the top, but it's all right. So I sign off, CEO, great exercise policy. Well done, Sally, thank you very much. And then I have a look in my exercise department. So I'm the CEO and I walk down the stairs and I go to the basement. And I open the basement door and all the lights are off and there's no computers in there, but there's a guy kind of sitting there saying, I'm in the exercise department. Am I meant to be doing anything? Or am I, is anybody want to, like there are KPIs and I'm not. So I could see that just having a look at the departments in my company, there was a big red flag. Here is a red flag of, do I think it's a good idea to exercise? Yes, I've written a policy. Am I exercising? No. So there could be an issue there. What do I want to happen? What do I want to have happen there? I am the CEO. Nobody cares about my company more than I do. And really, I don't care what they think. 
So I've got two options. I can rewrite the policy, which goes like this. Sally's exercise policy should be, well, Master Chef is coming on soon. So let's go there. Sally's exercise policy should be to put the kids to bed and then get back to the couch as quick as she can, sit down, watch Master Chef, and eat ice cream directly out of the tub. I'm good at that exercise policy. I don't think it's sound, though. The other way to approach, approach it is to change my behaviour, which is more difficult but worthwhile considering. Because this company is just all about me wanting to direct it the way it should be directed. And who cares more than me? Which makes me want to let you know that um, we need to say somebody, well, quite a few people say, yes, my husband's in my company. And I say, no, your husband doesn't work for you. He's, not, he's got his own company. He's not an employee of yours. So your husband, your partner, your mum, whoever, they, are, they have strong, they're invested in your company. They want your company to do well, but they're running their own company over here. So it's up to you to have a look at your company. <coughs> I, think, I think something worthy to note as, as I finish is to have a look at who you are. You know, I really would like more time. Have a think about who you are. And I like this quote that says, people can't live with change if there's not a changeless core inside you. You need to find out who you are. It's such a big question. Who you are just... And, but it's easy. You break it down into little steps. Who, what are your strengths? What are you thankful for? What do you love doing? What are the joys in life? Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your energy? Just day to day. Not big picture, let's write mission statements. I'm not saying that stuff. I'm just saying, what do you do each day? Get to know what you actually truly love and get out of this life and really incorporate that into routine. Because we all face change and we'll face change health-wise and in a million other ways because we're not immune to anything else happening in our life just because we're diagnosed with something like this. The key to the ability to change is a changeless sense of who you are, what you're about, and what you value. And I'll add to that your strengths. This is what I would love my kids to grow up with, a strong sense that anything can happen at any time and I'll be okay. I'll be all right. It doesn't mean I want all the bad stuff to happen, but you know what? It's all right. I'll get through it. Wouldn't that be a nice place to be able to feel that sense of security? And you can do it. You work on it. So I want you to take a moment as you leave today or in the next few days to have a think about your psychological resources and if they need a little bit of attention to just build that resilience. It's a constant art and practice to just keep building it. Talk about it. Psychologists are not there for when just everything is now bare and I've lost my stuff and I am at the depths. That's not the best time to see a psychologist. The best time is when you think, hmm, maybe I've got a few things that I just need to work through. And then I'll just know that that person, if I've got a good rapport with them, I know that they'll be there down the track if I need them, if things get hard. Figure out your strengths and use them to your advantage. I wanted to let you know that I have some handouts if you're interested. One about that CEO analogy. Um, one about a mindfulness app that I'd love everyone to look at but I didn't have time to talk about called Smiling Mind, but there are a million others. Some people are familiar with it. Yeah. And if you don't like it, use a different one. But if you like it, great. Um, I gave a presentation once just quickly and I said, um, my, I told my husband to do it. He refuses to do anything I say because he says, I know you're a psychologist, I know what you're doing. <laughs> and I said to him, please just try this app. And he was like, fine. So he goes and tries it. He came back, I'm never using it again. Why not? I said, the guy's voice on this app, I've only heard is you know, quite good. Everybody thinks it's quite neutral, it's okay. And he goes, well, he sounds good looking. He sounds probably wealthy. I'm not gonna listen to what he says. <clears throat> and somebody in Geelong put their hand up at a presentation I gave. And I said, yes. And she said, he lives in my street. He is very good looking. <laughs> I thought that was gold. So now you're all going to have a look, you listen, so you can see if you think it's... Um, the NDIS is a big thing. So I just thought I'd bring that form um, that I've got, which says if you consider, if you're part of the NDIS, if you're considering being part of the NDIS, you can access psychological support through that. 
It's amazing. You can do it through Skype as well, and you can't in Medicare, but you can in the NDIS. So there's a hand out there. And a lot of people say to me, how do I find a good psychologist near me? It's like the million dollar question. And um, I've put it on a work uh, information sheet, but essentially just call a lot of them and wait until you find one that you think, oh, they sound all right. I reckon I could work with them. But there's some more detail there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just get rid of this. Okay, I've got to, um, I've got to connect up with Dr. Michael Levy.